the world most honored watch is Longines. Longine watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Colonel Anselm Talbert, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Frederick R. Couder, Jr., a United States representative from New York. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Couder, our chronoscope audience many of them remember that you uh, inspired the investigation of communist activity in the New York schools recently and particularly they know you now as a fighting member of the House Appropriations Committee who is trying to do something about what you think is excessive government spending. They're familiar with this uh, rather sensational resolution that you have recently introduced. Now as the first question sir, uh, Will you tell us first what this resolution is that you've introduced in Congress? Fundamentally, uh, Mr. Huey, this resolution provides the only practical method by which the people of this country can effectively save themselves from complete bankruptcy and stop spending at a reasonable level. All right, now it's a resolution to, to halt spending and to bring it to what you call a reasonable level. Now specifically, how will it do that? The reasonable level uh, that must be applied is the same level that every householder applies in his own personal affairs. The limitation must be available income. And available income, in this case of course, means the proceeds of the intolerably heavy tax burden that the American people are suffering under the day. And I say that our government must not and cannot go on spending more than the people are willing and able to pay in taxes. And that's precisely what this administration means to do unless we can stop them. Mr. Couder, uh, these aren't normal times. And I wonder just how what you propose would cut into our proposed expenditures for the national defense and for foreign aid? Well, obviously, uh, if any effective reduction is to be made in the fantastic proposals of the president to spend something like $85 billion for three years in a row, there must be some reduction uh, in the enormous requests for military funds and some reduction in the foreign aid requests. Now, the, the suggestion that there be such a reduction is obviously not revolutionary because my resolution was specifically and expressly endorsed at the time I announced it by none other than former Ambassador Douglas, our United States Ambassador to Great Britain, who as much as any other man was responsible for the Marshall Plan and responsible for the development of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, Mr. Douglas said to me in a letter that uh, a 71 limitation must be adhered to in order to save the solvency and security of the United States. Let's, let's before we kick these billions around, sir, uh, most of us don't know much, uh, don't know the difference between 70 billions and 85 billions. Now, uh, you're telling us tonight that our taxes, these very heavy taxes that have been levied, are likely to bring in about 71 billions during 1952. Is that correct, sir? That is the president's own estimate. I see. Now, and you, do you believe that we have reached the, the wise limit for peacetime taxation? I haven't any doubt about it. But uh, I don't ask you or our listeners to rely upon my opinion. Senator George, who's chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate, a Democrat, 
And Mr. Doughton, who is chairman of Ways and Means in the House, which imposes the taxes, and a great many others in the Congress have said we've reached oh, the limit. There aren't going to be. Now, now there, you, you're saying that there is an agreement between both Republicans and, and Democrats that 71 billions is a tax limit now, that we can't go above that. Agreement isn't exactly the word. There's recognition. Recognition. That the people won't pay any Recognition. Tax. And the president wants to spend 85 billions or 14 billions right. more. And, and your resolution is designed to prevent that. To prevent and how, how would your resolution prevent that, sir? It would impose by congressional action a limitation of $71 billion upon spending. He would be forbidden to spend a dime more than the $71 billion. And if the resolution passes, he would be required to submit within 30 days a brand new budget dividing up the 71 million piece of pie. Now, is there a growing support for your resolution? What, what evidence is of support have you found, sir? The most amazing evidence of support, quite frankly, indicating perhaps the beginning of a grassroots taxpayers' revolt back home. Only today, uh, Senator Morse of Oregon, who's known as one of the great liberals on the Republican side, demanded a fifth $15 billion reduction with $9 billion out of foreign aid and the military establishment. Senator Paul Douglas, also a Democrat uh, from Illinois, uh, uh, one of the favorite liberals on the Democratic side, uh, himself said the other day that we ought to take at least $4 billion out of the military establishment and something <coughs> like a million, billion and a half or two out of the foreign aid program. So there is a universal expression of desire to cut by a great many of these fellows in the House and Senate, but there's no vehicle to make it effective unless something is done, as is suggested in my resolution. Well, Mr. Kuder, suppose the Chinese Communists march into Indochina this spring. Uh, where would that leave your plan? Do you mean by that, Colonel, that uh, what do we do if there should be another great war scare and a serious threat of immediate third war operations? Yes, exactly. Well, I think the answer to that is very simply that Congress is always in session these days, unfortunately for members and for the country sometimes, so that any uh, legislation that we enact now or any budget that we adopt now on the assumption that we're in for a long pull at high level can be tossed overboard in 24 hours by congressional action. We're always there. Would, would your uh, budget plan prevent enactment of uni uh, legislation for universal military training? I don't think it would affect the matter one way or the other. If the administration and the professional military honestly wanted a UMT, and we're honestly determined to develop a UMT as an alternative to the present uh, intolerably large standing forces, there'd be enormous savings in it. But I don't, I'm not so sure they mean to use it that way. I'm going to wait and see. Congressman, for our listeners tonight, can you illustrate quickly just how these budget arguments in Congress affect the average American family? Well, let the average American family uh, ask uh, itself what its dollars were worth 10 years ago when they were worth 100 cents and what they're worth today in purchasing power at 53 cents. And when they answer that question, they'll know what excessive federal spending has done. The, uh, the devil in inflation, fundamentally, is federal spending of more money than we take in in taxes. That is the source of inflation and that is what every American is paying for every morning uh, in the cost of his breakfast food and, his, and uh, his dinner and his radio and his car and everything else. Are you saying that if your resolution can be passed and if the government is held to 71 billions spending this year, that that will reduce the threat of inflation? I think it's the surest way to limit inflation and to reestablish something like a sound financial basis in the United States so that people can look forward with some measure to security and certainty in their day-to-day -day operations, always barring, of course, the possibility of an all-out war, which would upset all plans, uh, obviously. Well, how close is your <coughs> resolution to actually being realized? Well, at the moment, it's resting in a heavily weighted New Deal committee of the House. 
Uh, a great step forward was made uh, last Monday or Tuesday when the Republican Policy Committee unanimously endorsed it uh, with a very strong statement by Minority Leader Joe Martin of Massachusetts. I think that means that uh, having made it a party issue, our people will press for it. And enough Democrats have committed themselves to the general proposition of substantial reduction that I'm sure if it ever can be gotten to the floor, it will be passed. Now, sir, there are some people I know that would like to help you. Uh, would you like, uh, I'd like your prediction as to whether you can do something now and whether you can get this resolution passed and what can any average American who would like to help you, what can he do, sir? Mr. Huey, uh, despite any fears to the contrary, we are still living in a free country. Americans are still masters of their fate if they choose to assert themselves. All we need is a real grassroots revolt. There is nothing more sensitive uh, on earth than a member of Congress in an election year. All they've got to do is hear from the folks back home and believe me, they'll get action. Now, I believe, sir, and to sum up for our audience, I believe that you say that you are trying to force the government to spend only 71 billions and only what we will be realized from taxes, that you think that you can accomplish that if there are enough American citizens who will write to their congressmen and try to impose a system of economy on the present government. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Colonel Ansel Talbert and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Frederick R. Couder, Jr., United States Representative from New York. Travelers to the Olympic Winter Games at Oslo, from wherever they come, will find the familiar touch of home in windows of fine jewelry stores. Longines, the world's most honored watch, for the fame of Longines is worldwide. In the mountain high city of La Paz, Bolivia in South America, or historic Athens in ancient Greece, or the sacred city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, in any of the capitals of 77 countries of the free world, the watch of first choice with discriminating men and women is Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories. These are Longines watches. And if you pay 71.50 or more for a watch for yourself, or as a gift, you're paying the price of a Longine. Why not insist on getting a Longine, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Longine, exclusive official watch for the Olympic Winter Games of 1952. This is Frank Knight again. Inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.